Hello and welcome to this ESS City University NatSen and GEMPOP Web 2 seminar. I'm delighted to welcome you all um, today to hear um, we have a different format than our usual format. We have three panellists who are going to introduce themselves shortly, um, chaired by Professor Peter Lynn, um, and they will be talking about um, methods for um, within household selection in probability sample surveys and discussing some of the issues. So the way the, the seminar is going to work is that we're going to have a brief introduction and then uh, each of the speakers will speak in turn. If you have questions for the speakers, then please use the Q&A um, option at which if you're on a laptop will be at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can type in your question and then we'll, we'll take questions that are to do with um, clarification after each speaker and then we'll open it up for a wider discussion at the end. The seminar is being recorded, so I hope that's OK with everybody. Um, and I'll now hand over to Olga, who's going to say a little bit more about GEMPOP Web. Thank you so much, Debbie. Good evening, everyone. I'm Olga Maslovska, and I'm an assistant professor in social statistics and demography at the University of Southampton. I'm also a principal investigator on ESRC funded project, which supports activities of GenPOP Web 2 network. We were very, very excited that we were able to reestablish GenPOP Web network. Uh, if you don't know what this network is about, just a couple of words about this. So GenPOP Web 2 Network is a network of academic and non-academic partners in the UK and abroad, collaborating and sharing knowledge, experiences and learning uh, in the area of online data collection in social surveys. We are planning various activities between now and August 2021. And if you would like to have notifications about these activities, please join our mailing list. Today's event was organized jointly with City University, ESS, NATS and Natson. But for GenPOP Web 2 uh, network, this event is very special because the, this is the, our first public event organized by the network. And uh, the fantastic speakers and the chair make this event even more special. And I'm really looking forward to the presentations today and to the discussion. Thank you all very, very much. And over to you, Peter. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Olga, for that, those introductions to the evening. Um, I'm Peter Lynn from the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex, and my job is to chair the seminar this evening. Um, I'm delighted to do so. The, the topic of within the household selection methods is something that has interested me since the very start of my survey research career, which um, I'm embarrassed to say was 33 years ago. One of the first tasks that I was given as a, as a junior survey researcher was to travel around the country going to interview and briefings for face-to-face -face surveys. Um, and part of the task was to brief these interviewers on a version of the Kish grid selection method that was used at that time, which involved asking um, for the first name or initial of all the people in the household. Um, and then the interviewer would have to list them in alphabetical order and use a lookup table to, to identify who had been selected. And I remember being asked um, awkward questions by interviewers about this procedure. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, the words that they used 33 years ago, but I remember somebody putting me on the spot with something along the lines of, um, suppose the person is called Rebecca, but they call themselves Becky. Should I list that under R or B? And I think this illustrates quite nicely um, one of the gray areas involved in these kind of selection methods. So, yeah, so, you know, when there are gray areas in, in survey procedures, there is the risk that these can be then exploited um, by either respondents or interviewers for one reason or another. Um, there's also a risk that things can go wrong accidentally when it's not completely unambiguous how the procedure is supposed to be implemented. I remember that these interviewers and interviewer briefings also used to grumble sometimes about the intrusive nature of asking for this information when, when they've only just arrived and they're standing on the doorstep and they're expected to ask for the first names of everyone living in the household. 
and interviewers would often say, well, th this is a really bad idea because it causes some people to, to refuse to do this. And, you know, I might have got the interview if only you'd let me just interview the helpful person I was talking to rather than ask this, this intrusive information at the start. So this is another one of the, the concerns we have is that procedures may have an impact on how likely it is that a household or a person cooperates with the survey. So I think these kind of anecdotes highlight two sources of error that we worry about with within household selection me methods of any kind. Um, so one is the likelihood that, that people will participate, the cooperation, and the other is the risk that selections will be done incorrectly, there will be a selection error. Now, of course, those, um, those concerns are writ even larger when we're not talking about an interview administered survey as I was back in those days, but a self completion survey where we're reliant on um, the respondents or the participants to implement these uh, procedures for us. Now I'm just going to share one slide with you, if I may. Um, I, I suggest that it might be helpful during the course of this, this webinar this evening um, to just bear this, this, uh, <laughs> this in mind, this, this slide. So the two, the two error sources that I've alluded to are the two things at the top, the risk that cooperation uh, may be affected by the selection method. This can have an effect on non-response error, um, but also the risk that the selection of a person to collect the data from will be done incorrectly. Either of those things can potentially affect the composition of the sample, the sample representativeness, if you like. And the reason we worry about that is because it might bias our estimates. That's ultimately what we care about. Is, is there an error in, in the estimates that we make? Um, so each of these steps is, is important. We're worried about those two things for that reason, but the same method, the same selection method, might work better for one survey than another, simply because the sample representativeness effects are more or less associated with the survey variables. It depends what we're trying to measure in the survey. So I simply want to suggest you maybe just keep that little framework in, in mind while you listen to our excellent speakers that we have lined up this evening. Um, and with that, um, I am going to hand over to the speakers in turn. Um, we have three excellent speakers. I, I know all of them personally. I know they're all excellent researchers and they're certainly experts in the topic that we are discussing this evening. Um, I am not going to give each of the uh, speakers a lengthy introduction, not because they don't deserve it, but because I'm guessing you uh, already know something about them if you, as you've signed up to this webinar where a, a description of each of them uh, appears. Um, so I'm going to hand over with no further ado to Kristen Alston from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, to give her presentation. Kristen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I think you all can see that. So thank you so much. I am Kristen Olson. I'm a professor of sociology and director of the Bureau of Sociological Research here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where it is high noon instead of in the evening. Um, so I have been thinking through the idea of, of the within household selection process um, for a number of years now. And one of the things that I, I think is important to consider when we're talking about within household selection in self-administered surveys is there are a number of steps in that process that are out of the control of us as the researchers. So what I wanna do is sort of walk through the process of within household selection in self-administered surveys and in, in general population web surveys from sort of a 30,000 foot level and then narrow down into different types of within household selection procedures. 
So we as the survey organization will first start by sending a request to a household. That a request hopefully arrives at the household unharmed and hopefully an envelope is opened that contains information about the survey and the request that we are putting forward to the respondent. We hope that then the letter that informs the respondent or potential respondent about how the selection should be made will be read and that whatever requisite composition of the household is needed in order to uh, complete the selection process is evaluated accurately. Some surveys have a screening instrument that requires um, some set of completion of survey questions in order for the within household selection to be done, and we hope that that's done accurately. And then the important part is that that person who is the intended respondent under the within household selection procedure is actually selected correctly. Now, you'll, you might notice that there are question marks after each of these stages, and that's because those steps have places where things might go wrong. But it doesn't just go wrong when that person may or may not be selected correctly is that we may have a handoff that is needed. That is the person who opened the uh, mail and did the within household selection process may not be the person who is actually the one who should be completing the survey under that selection process. And therefore, the person who is uh, selected then needs to be notified about that selection. Hopefully, they participate. Hopefully, they accurately report things in the survey. And the survey is completed, at which point it ends up back in our hands. So you'll notice that the yellow boxes are the places where we as the survey organization have some set of control over what is happening. And all the intermediate processes are steps that happen within the household that is in question. So this becomes really interesting from a total survey error perspective because all of the places where things can go wrong are issues that really are affecting this representation slide. This is analogous to the slide that Peter just showed us where we may have some errors in evaluating the household composition that might lead to a mis match between the frame that we are using for selecting people within the household and our target population, which might be all adults in that household. It may be that something happens in the selection of people within the household, and we have some errors that arise between the sample that is selected and, and the list from the, from the sampled household. And then, of course, people may not respond. And if people misreport their household composition, our weights that are based off of random selection within the household can also go awry, leading to all of the errors on the representation slide side of this slide. But what's really interesting from for me from a survey methods perspective is that these misreporting of household composition of who lives in the household um, and other questions that we might ask of a sample uh, household in order to evaluate who should be answered really appears on the measurement side. That is something's going wrong in answering the set of questions often that are required in order to do that selection procedure. So what we end up having is a measurement error that manifests as some kind of either coverage error or sampling error along the, along the way. So there, one of the things I want to, to have as this 30,000 foot view is that there is not one way of having, of doing a within household selection in a general population survey from a self-administered mode. And a task force that I chaired for APOR um, reviewed a number of different within household selection methods that are used in self-administered uh, modes, including both mail and web. And the, the, the sets of within household selection procedures can be separated into two general approaches. One of those sets of approaches separates the rostering step that's done by the household from the selection step. The second approach has the rostering and selection step all within the hands of the household. These are important because the instructions that go to the households uh, differ depending on which set of approaches, either the two stage approach where the roster is collected and then the survey organization does the selection and then we ask the person to participate who is selected versus trying to put all the instructions within the cover letter itself. 
So I'll talk about a couple examples of this just to make it more clear. So some survey organizations that use the rostering and then selection approach ask for a household roster right away. So in the National Survey of Children's Health, which is a mixed mode mail and web survey conducted by the National for the National Center for Health Statistics, the household is asked for the number of children in the household and then any household that has more than one, uh, one or more child children completes a full roster for all the children in the household. And then the web instrument randomly selects one of those children to be the target of more focused questions. On the other hand, some surveys roster after asking a little bit about the household composition. For example, the 2016 national election studies done here in the US uh, first asked about the number of adults at the household asked a question about eligibility. The uh, ANES requires citizens to be selected and then random and then used what's uh, the what I refer to as the Rizzo Brick and Park style of selection where either the the screener respondent is randomly selected or the other adult in the household for any adult for any household that has two or more adults when there are three or more households three or more adults in the household then a roster is 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 requested so it still has a rostering step but it is select uh, but it is only done for larger households the methods that include the rostering and selection step in one stage use a variety of non-probability, quasi-probability, uh, uh, non-probability and quasi-probability methods. These might include asking any knowledgeable adult to complete the household, asking all of the adults in the household to complete the survey, or using what I call an age order selection, which is having a specific combination of the age and order of uh, the age of the person in the household relative to uh, the order of the, the ages. So, so for example, asking the older adult in the household to complete the survey, as shown here as an example from a pilot for the California Health Interview Survey. There, of course, the collection of birthday methods, which ask either the person who has the next birthday or the uh, most re or the the most recent birthday, the last birthday, to complete the survey. And there's a variety of ways to do these. Now, all of these approaches have ways that this can go wrong. And so this, uh, the, the issue of having this selection uh, go awry is something that I've been working on in some of the work we've been doing here. My colleague Jolene Smith and I developed what we call the confirmation method. And this is where we ask the person who is the respondent to simply confirm that they are the person with the next birthday in the household. And we hypothesized here that if we simply do this one step of asking people to verify that they're the right person, that we might be able to increase people's commitments to doing the survey accurately and increase the selection accuracy. There might be a slight trade off with response rates because that person might not want to do the survey, but we might be able to increase the rate at which those selections were done correctly. So we did this through this question, are you the adult age 18 or older in your household who will have the next birthday? You can see this looks like the screenshot from a mail survey and in fact it was. Um, and our hypotheses were correct. We had a slight reduction in the overall response rate to our mail survey, but it increased the accuracy of selection within the household. Now, the, you might say this is just in a mail survey. What about in a web survey? And in 2018, the California Health Interview Survey replicated this twice. So in, in a pilot study in the spring and in the fall of 2018, the CHIS conducted two experiments uh, examining whether or not asking people to simply confirm that they're the person in the household with the next birthday would increase the accuracy rate of selection within the household. Accuracy rate was evaluated in all of these studies using a household roster. And you can see that they found what we did, that simply that's, that act of active confirmation increased the, the accuracy of selection within the household. So as we think through within household selection methods in web surveys and in general population self-administered surveys, there are a few things to consider. So the first is how do we evaluate what works with, our, with any set of within household selection methods? And there's a variety of different criteria that we can use. These include response rates under different selection methods, 
comparisons of the achieved respondent pools from our survey to some uh, high quality external benchmark, comparison of important survey estimates across the different methods that we use, or evaluating the proportion of people in the study that accurately follow the selection procedures. Most of our general population web surveys are not web alone. There's another, there's another mode that's involved. The most commonly used uh, mode for recruitment tends to be mail, but there may also be telephone or in-person uh, recruitment methods that are used. And of course, follow-up to all of the web requests may also become uh, be done in any of these other modes. And then um, it's useful to think through what theoretical insights we might use in order to improve the within household selection methods. So work that we have done um, focuses on methods or on mechanisms that we refu we refer to as confusion about what who is who lives in the household people's concealment over not wanting to reveal who lives in the household, commitment to doing the work, the hard work to being a survey respondent. And in the cases where we select more than one person in the household, potential contagion within that household. It's also important to think about what uh, what survey estimates might be affected when something, uh, when the selection procedure goes awry. And here it's really critical to think about where, whether these estimates are likely to experience heterogeneity on the constructs of interest within the household. One thing to consider here has to do with the, with household tasks. So who does what in the household? Who does the dishes? Who folds the laundry? Who gets the mail? These, these tasks that are going to have variation within the household are more likely to vary depending on the selection procedure that we use and whether it's followed accurately. And then finally, do the selection methods require an active set of selection or an active set of answering questions in order for them to be uh, followed through, or is it passive, put in the hands of the person in the household separately. So with that, I'm going to stop my 30,000 foot view on this and turn it back over to you, Peter. Thanks, Kristen. That, that was really great. Um, as Debbie mentioned at the beginning, we have a few minutes for brief clarification questions after each presentation, but we'd like to keep the general discussion all to the end when all the panelists can join in. Um, if anyone has any brief clarification questions, um, please put them in the Q&A now. I will just pause for a moment in case you want a moment to put your question in. Excellent. We have a question. <laughs> uh, a very good one. Can you just briefly tell us, Kristen, on these studies, what method was used to identify the accuracy of the selection? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So in all the work that we have done and in the work that the CHIS has done and in, in uh, other studies, we collect a household roster in the questionnaire later in the survey. So this is separate from the household selection step, it's sort of, you know, towards the end of the survey where we might be collecting demographic information, where we then have information about people uh, that, that the, the respondent reports about who all lives in the household, the birthdays for every person who lives in the household, their um, uh, self-identified gender and other characteristics that might be relevant for, for the selection procedure. But, that, so that's that's how we do it. And then we, we calculate, for example, in the studies we did, who in the household actually had the next birthday? And is that the person who uh, was, the, was the actual respondent? Thanks. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> is there a concern about the quality or accuracy of the demographic information given if the respondent is not the household head? So I think that the, the question is, how does one evaluate composition of a household? That is, do, who, who, who knows who lives in a household? And there's been a long line of work um, for many, many years um, here in the US, uh, some of it related to the decennial census, some of it related to evaluating coverage for other surveys. And, and this is hard, right? This is hard of how do you actually get the right list of people in the household. Most, um, you know, most of that work shows that most households 
are able to report people in the household, but there are there is confusion over who lives somewhere. So if somebody stays mul has multiple places where they stay, it leads to more confusion. Um, and if people are uh, receive say transfer benefits that are tied to certain people living or not living in a household, that might lead to concealment of who lives in the household. Um, and so these this is a really this is a really hard question. I don't think there's a good answer to it, which is why we try to measure the mechanisms that we can through any kinds of questions that we ask in the survey, or through any other auxiliary data. So um, so does it is is it uh, easy? No. Do I think that most people or most households are probably reporting the composition accurately? That's the assumption that we're making, um, and and we assume that no matter who is the respondent, that is that the household composition in the roster is 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 correctly done. But that's the same that we would make in any kind of in person interview where we might open the door and ask an adult on the household to tell us who lives there, so that the respondent can engage in, say, the KISH selection method or any other within household selection um, that we do. Good. I think Jerry Nicholas would like to come in on this question too. Is that right, Jerry? No, that's fine. I've got no. Nope. <laughs> no. The moment has passed. Okay, that's fine. In which case, um, I don't see any other questions at this point. So let's move on to our second speaker, um, who is Patton Smith. Patton, over to you. Hi, I'm going to be completely incompetent at sharing my screen. Um, that looks like. Has that worked? Yep. Is that working? Okay, good. Right. So I'm Patton Smith. I am Director of Research Methods at Ipsos Mori. I'm um, fairly ancient. I've been working in the Asian survey agency sector since the 1980s. Um, that, that's, that's who I am. Um, I'm sharing this present the authorship of this presentation with Kevin Pickering, who is Head of Statistics at Ipsos Mori. Um, and essentially, he does the thinking and I do the talking. So that's that's uh, that gives you a brief lowdown on what we're talking about, what we're doing, what's happening here. Um, now, Kristen was talking about from the thirty thousand foot level. I'm kind of inhabiting a region somewhere between a thousand and a hundred and a hundred feet, I think, because what I'm going to be doing is talking about how we evolved the now standard or semi-standard Ipsos Mori method for household selection in web push surveys um, and what I got is and, and our, our standard methods called the any two adults method um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we developed it how it works and how good it is um, maybe and then just end with a little thought about um, how we might uh, improve it or finesse it so why the fuss I, I'm not sure I really need to say this because I think I think Peter's really Covered this already, and, and we haven't got an awful lot of time. And essentially, we need yeah, we need to we need a decent selection method in order to get from a genuine random probability sample of addresses to a genuine random probability sample of individuals. And that's that in essence, that's what it's about. I think Peter's explained that. I shall move on. Um, now, I'm I'm really this, well, in these slides. I'm going to be talking about the the kind of thought process as you went through when we first started doing web push surveys. Um, so a, a little bit about the, the underlying logic which led to the method we developed. So when de developing random samples of individuals from, in, from address samples, usually people usually consider three main options. They're not the only ones, as Karen pointed out, they're not the only ones, uh, Kristen's pointed out, they're not the only ones um, that are around, but the three main ones tend to be thought about. Um, the first is the two-stage data collection, um, which uh, which Kristen mentioned, which is where you've got a, essentially a screening stage. Then you then they report back to the office, the office of selection, and then uh, send uh, send um, questionnaires for the main stage. Um, second is uh, one stage um, 
where we use birthday or random methods to select one adult. So that's done within the household selection. Select, selection. Um, and the, the other one stage method, this is, this is method three, which, it, which Joel, I guess, will be talking about after me a bit more, is to select all adults. So essentially, instead of just selecting one using a random process, you say in your random, random probability sample of households, okay, I want every eligible person to participate. That still delivers you a random sample. Now, the last bullet here says it's actually more complicated than this, um, this rather simplistic um, uh, triad of uh, options. Um, and, and as we we'll, we'll kind of discuss later, because indeed the method we're, I'm about to describe rather complicates it. So let me go on. Um, what are the problems with these options before I move on to what motivate or well, really what motivates us to develop the new method? Um, the, well, the two stage one is it costs a lot more essentially. I mean, and it's a bit it's a bit kind of creaky these days. I mean, it's, it depends much more on kind of offline um, or it's more appropriate to offline um, data collection. You know, when one sends a postal screening questionnaire, got the returns, and send a postal maker. Um, so it costs more, it's going to take longer, and it's going to deliver no, lower net response rates. So we, we didn't take that one seriously in our thinking. Um, so the second, asking a household to select um, one adult using random or more commonly quasi random protocols, quasi random usually one of the birthday methods, lost or next. Um, well, there's considerable evidence out there that compliance is low. You know, wrong answers. I mean, the, the, the figure I see cited regularly is around 25%. So around 25% of the selections are wrong. And that's including in the base, the households where you can't do a selection. Like you know, if you're taking, you've got a single uh, pair, a single adult household. Um, if you ignore those and just go to the, go to the households where you where a selection is actually possible to plus house, uh, adult households, well, you'll end up with something in the 30s. So it's clearly going pretty wrong. Um, the third is the ask all adults method. Um, and that um, is simple, requires no selection. So it's easy to, to do it. Um, and, you know, so, so on, the, on the face of it, it looks like it ought to be a good, uh, a good method. But there are problems attached to it. So I'm just going to move my... That's it. I couldn't see, I couldn't see my slides. Sorry. Uh, so, what are the problems? Well, the first problem I put in square brackets because it really only applies to punctilious techies, which perhaps I am one. I don't know. Maybe. Um, which is, that if you get all adults in a household, then you have you have a household level cluster. Um, that, of course, leads to some some reduction in your uh, in your um, statistical efficiency. But then you've got less weighting. So it's a minor problem. So I'm going to pass that one by. Um, I don't I don't think that's a major issue. The more, much more important issue is that web push surveys have to use conditional incentives. We well, have to use incentives, and I mean the ones that we use in UK are conditional to raise response rates, often in the in the five now really ten pound per respondent kind of range. Now the problem here is, if you go to a household and you ask one person to 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 send, return a questionnaire, well, the, the household as a whole gets ten quid. The household with four questionnaires, four people responding, gets forty quid. So. Is the temptation, is there not, for the less honest folk out there to invent household members? One person living on their own could get 40 quid if they simply make up questionnaires for three invented household members. Uh, so there's clearly the motive there, and there's a worry for us researchers there. The question then is, does this actually happen? Um, well, there's circumstantial evidence of some fabrication. And here I'm relying to a large degree on, on the work that Cantar uh, with Joel did uh, in, de in various bits of development work on for, for the um, or for the all adults uh, method which which I referred to earlier um, and there seems to be there seems to be ev evidence in one of the reports that around four percent of households were answering or sorry returning more questionnaires and they reported there being adult household members in the household um, and then in the community life development, survey development work, some slightly scary looking stuff, which um, the individual value within um, household response rate for four questionnaire households was substantially higher than the average one, 33% versus an overall uh, response rate of 22%. That's, that looks a bit fishy. Um, and also the response time 
in the four questionnaire households were considerably faster. They were completing the questionnaires at 28 instead of 38 minutes. All that, I know it's circumstantial, but all that was enough to worry us. Um, more recently, some work that Peter has just done on the innovation panel also seems to be indicating that if you tell uh, um, households they're going to get uh, each person get an incentive and you want all people in the household to do it, you end up with uh, magically with la slightly larger reported household sizes. So which again, it all goes in the same direction. So that worried us. Um, so we felt we're in a dilemma really with apparent choice. We select one adult and get a large number of incorrect selections or we ask all adults and risk getting inviting people uh, to invent so-called respondents. So how do we address it? Well, we address it by, well, uh, <laughs> asking uh, my esteemed colleague, Kevin Pickering, head of statistics um, at Exos Mori, uh, to have a think about it. We thought about it, um, but I think it was particularly inspired by the Rizzo uh, telephone survey selection method in his thinking, um, which Kristen's referred to earlier, uh, and he came up with the NE2 adults method, which is actually peculiarly simple. Um, so let me just uh, let me describe it. The first thing to bear in mind, though, is it, it, it takes advantage of information data we know about the household structures in the UK. Now, this table just shows from around the time we we're doing this thinking, 2015, the the, the distribution of um, number of ad number of adults in households, or households by number of adults in them, um, taken from the labour force survey, gold standard survey. And what we can see, the key thing to take away from this table is 85% of households contain only one or two adults. Uh, and that I think is what led to the Eureka, the, the Kevin's Eureka moment. So if we survey two adults per household, for 85% of households, we don't need to do a selection because they've only got one or two adults anyway. So we're taking everybody. So that means for 85% we're on safe ground. Um, but what, what do we do with the other 15%? Well, you know, the, the, the punctilious techie like me um, would have probably have then gone through a full selection process um, of taking, uh, uh, selecting two at randomly. But um, Kevin's, I think, rather brilliant moment here was simply to say, no, don't worry, just let any two participate, just let any two do it. Now, it's not random. So the punctilious techie in me screams, oh, wow, that, that is, that's a worry. But Let's have, a th let's have a look at the actual probability that the people, the, the any two, would have got in there with a random sample. Now, if they'd been a fully complied with random selection, then 94% of the people that, of the any twos would have been selected anyway. So, in fact, we've only got about 6% of people that are, that are in incorrectly selected. And that just, to our, to our minds, didn't see enough to be likely to lead to any major biasing in the sample. And if we anyway, if we had gone on and selected two, uh, two in the um, adults in the three plus house using random methods, some of those would be non-compliant, as we've shown before, and, and so it's saying 25% of those selections are non-compliant, then 4% would have been incorrectly selected, as opposed to the 6% using the method we adopted. So we don't think it made any difference is actually worth talking about. Furthermore, the, if you did a random selection, it would be more burdensome and would lower response rates. So that was uh, the logic underlying the method. Um, so how does it compare um, to, to, the, to the other methods? Well, we clearly get fewer incorrect selections if we do the, to do the select one at random or using a quasi-random process. It's about 6% versus 25%, and pretty similar to if we selected the two at random, 6% versus 4%. So that seems to be pretty much in its favor, I think. Um, the incentive to invent extra household members, now comparing to the, to the take all household members, the incentive to invent uh, household members is considerably reduced, but it's not eliminated. After all, 35% of households are single adult. They may be tempted to invent another household member so they can double the incentive they get. Um, but that's all they can do. So the, reward, the rewards they get are less. They, they can't get the 40 quid with a 10 pound incentive, they can only get 20. But of course, it doesn't eliminate the, the incentive to invent. Um, and there seems to be some circumstantial evidence um, that there may still be some invention going on, but less than with the all adult method. 
here is the circumstantial evidence, all taken from surveys around the same time we were doing this thinking back back in the sort of, well in the in the in the last five years or so. Um, again, going to the Kantar reports, we seem to be finding that the reported number of adults in the household in the questionnaires is in the range of 2.07, 2.19, depends which report you look at. Um, as against the labour force survey estimate from the time, which is 1.86. So they seem to be reporting larger households. Uh, and what, yeah, the guy said it's circumstantial. The possible, the, possi yeah, the, the obvious thought is, well, maybe people are inventing household members and putting them in the household grids in order to uh, then be able to return more questionnaires and claim a bigger incentive. But ours is also bigger. This is, this is from one of the big um, web push surveys that we do at the moment, the Active Live Survey. Uh, and that's 1.92, which is again bigger than 1.86, but it's, it's less big. I mean, you know, the, the difference is smaller. So we feel relatively sanguine um, about that. Um, so conclusions, um, we, we don't claim to fully solve the problems. What we've got is a compromise method um, designed to control errors in individual selection, uh, but we're not pretending we've eliminated it completely. Uh, and that was, you know, that was our thinking is probably the best we can do is control rather than eliminate. But we are considering how we might improve the method. Um, and there is early evidence from a couple of sources that um, overall response rate may be higher if we use a kind of hybrid two-in-one stage approach. It's not quite the two stage that I referred to earlier and, and Kristen referred to earlier, but it's a kind of do, do two-in-one. Um, and the, the idea of this is the initial letter gets sent out will ask one adult, any adult in the household to complete the questionnaire, the adult online, the adult completes it online, and this includes the household grid. Then at the end of the interview, this respondent is asked to recruit another adult along the any the any two following the any two method um and now the, the the theory here is the incentive to invent adults is removed um because the person that's on, that has to is doing the household grid and telling you how many people live in the household doesn't know there's going to be extra incentivization for another person taking part until uh it, after the household grid has been done Anyway, we're hoping to, to test this in the near future. It has been tested on a small scale um, elsewhere, both actually in, in a study that Peter recently um, reported on and in some work Ipsos Mori done did for the, um, in the fundamental, fundamental Rights Survey, which Jerry was involved in back in 2017. So we're, we're fairly hopeful that this, this, yeah, this will be an, another incremental improvement. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patton. Um, we have uh, a couple of people have submitted um, pretty much the same clarification question, which is, um, I think you said something like uh, we're on safe ground with the 85% of cases where um, there's only one or two people in the household because there is no selection. Um, but that's assuming that, that that isn't offset by an additional, say, non-response problem when you're asking both people in the household to respond. So if the clarification question is basically what proportion of those people in two person households respond when you ask them both to. I don't have the figures to hand, but I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I always, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't give you a, you know, a full on answer to that. Um, without actually going investigating, but I mean, it's, again, it, that trade-off between getting a selection error and non-response error is is you know, it's a very real one. It's true, um, but I mean, I have to say that yeah, most of our focus on all this has been on getting the selection the selection error right because the non-response error is going to happen anyway. Yeah, I, I've been getting one or two notifications on my screen that people have been putting their hands up. That doesn't work in this forum. If you want to submit a question, you have to put it under the, the Q&A. Please do that. Um, I have one little clarification question of my, my own to which I also have the answer. All right, <laughs> the, good. To share this with you, because you, you mentioned from my study that, that 
notifying about the multiple incentives up front did result in a slightly higher proportion of households reporting more people in the household. Mm -hmm. um, that is true. But what we interestingly found was that at the next stage, in those, ho those households that had reported large numbers of people, um, in most cases, they didn't all take part in the survey. Typically, only one of them did. So they ended up only getting one conditional incentive. Um, and this kind of just raises the thought in my head that um, the extent to which people are likely to try and invent extra household members in order to earn extra incentives um, is really going to depend on how much effort they have to go to to get that incentive. If it's a survey that you can rush through in 10 minutes for each additional household member, it might be worth you doing that to get an extra five or 10 pounds. If they realise, having done the survey once and filled in our 45 minute quite complicated questionnaire, and that that's what they're going to have to do another three times. They might think, mm, maybe I won't bother to try and get these extra three incentives. So. I, I, I agree. I mean, and, and you know, the, the paragraphs in your paper on that you know, just demonstrates the water's a bit muddy there. Um, on the other hand, that there's a very, very real difference in the in the numbers. That's you know, for sure. So something's got something. I feel something's going on, unless it's just a bit of chance, chance variation. But it does you know, it does align with other the other data. But that's the problem with this. It is all circumstantial, isn't it? Um, but I take I take the point. Yeah, it may be that they bit off bit off more than they could chew. Yes. Good. Time is moving on. Thank you, Patton. Time to hand over to Joel Williams for our third and final presentation. Joel. Thanks, Peter. I'll uh, attempt to share screen without messing it up as well. Right. Can you see that, Peter? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, my name is Joel Williams. I'm the uh, head of methods at Kantar's uh, public division in the UK. And I'm going to talk about how Kantar tends to do web push surveys uh, with an address base, uh, what we and no one else in the industry calls uh, ABOS studies. Um, so, I mean, of course, it's true that every study has, has its own unique elements and different research commissioners have different appetites for risk or innovation. But in general, this is what we do. And the first thing I, I think is notable is that for a general population survey, we still tend to, uh, we, we certainly, as, as Patton does, avoid the within household sampling issue altogether. But we do take the mechanically simplest approach of asking all adult residents to take part. And we do this while recognizing the risk we take, given that we also make explicit in the letter uh, that each respondent will get a, a monetary thank you uh, for taking part. And there obviously, we did do some uh, fairly extensive research on this about five or six years ago, because there were some benefits to doing this. Uh, first of all, that as Patton mentions, although the there's some sort of household clustering if you're if you're doing uh, multiple individuals per household, but the weighting is less, so it tends to kind of compensate out. But the cost per completed questionnaire is also lower because you weren't doing quite so much postage because uh, some households yielded more than one uh, completed questionnaire. So there's some sort of attractive benefits there. Um, the test showed that in general, the data quality was similar to. Uh, when we had previously done it, which was essentially a sort of next birthday uh, style design. Now, there were some issues with households that apparently had four uh, adults within them and, and all of them uh, responded, but they weren't absolutely massive. So although they were, they completed them more quickly, they still spent 28 minutes over a survey that others were taking 38 minutes over. Um, and in most data quality metrics that we looked at, there didn't seem to be very much difference. So there were um, the risks perhaps were not um, not thought to be enormous. But that, nevertheless, you know, what do we do to limit the level of fabrications? Because we certainly believe that they exist. Um, the first thing that we do is to use auxiliary data from the firm CACI. I'm sure there's other firms that are available. Um, to, and we use that to determine the number of logins that are provided in the letter, which are either two, three or four with a mean of about 2.7. Um, so it's actually not that different from the limit of two that Patman has talked about. The advantage of using this data 
is that the limit that we use, the number of logins that we provide is at least correlated with the true household size. So that CACI data is by no means perfect, but it is strongly correlated enough for, for it to work in this, in this respect. So uh, only in the, the method we actually use, only 3% of people in sampled households are missing a login, but that of course assumes that um, everybody would respond if they could. Uh, and in, in practice, when you factor in household and uh, within household non-response, the actual real non-coverage rate uh, gets down to about 0.1%. So we find that as a reasonable compromise between some of the risks of the all adults design um, and the desire to nevertheless uh, give everybody the opportunity to take part. And naturally we use information from early responders to adjust uh, the number of logins um, offered in reminders and also the number of paper questionnaires which we may include uh, in the final reminder. And incidentally, in general, we directly offer uh, a paper questionnaire only when the CACI data or early respondent data suggests that there's a fair chance that an older person is living there who might otherwise uh, not take part. We also ask respondents to sign uh, a data declaration that they've answered for themselves uh, only once and honestly. And it's not used as a condition of the incentive, but more as a kind of deterrent. So effectively stressing the value of doing it properly. Uh, I've no real firm evidence for its effectiveness. Very few people refuse to sign it and we exclude any that do refuse. We exclude those from the data set that follows. So not signing this declaration is one of our red flags, which leads to automatic exclusion from that data set. Another one is providing the same name as another respondent in the household. Others are more like yellow flags that cumulatively, they may be indic indicative of fabrication, but not necessarily enough by themselves to be, to be a sign of that. So these include reporting the same email address or mobile telephone number uh, as another respondent. In actual fact, amongst older respondents, this is not completely uncommon. There's lots of people with shared uh, email addresses. Shared mobile numbers is less common, but it's still, it is still done. So it's not an absolute sign of uh, fabrication. Another sign is reporting different household details. I mean, certain amount of difference you might accept. So one of the things we do is if we ask the ages of other people in the household is to actually sum them up uh, across all the people who take part and see how much difference there is there. Um, and, and another feature is, of course, expanding the reported number of residents compared to an earlier response, which suggests that somebody's done it and then thought, well, I could do it again, but I will need to expand the household size to warrant this. Uh, and that's that's one of our one of our, our, our yellow flags. We also fold in some standard QC with respect to how long they've taken to do the, do the questionnaire, missing data rates, flatlining if it's that kind of survey. And all told, all of this put together, we tend to exclude about five to 10% of responses, depending on the, the threshold that we've agreed with our client. So that's, in a sense, the price of doing doing this relatively simple method is you've got to be able to find or reasonably well find who uh, the fabrications within the data set while of course retaining a, a wholly remote uh, surveying method. Um, just look into the future before finishing off. I think probably Patton's covered some of this already and I, I but I don't, I, I'm not, I'm at the point where I don't want to um, dismiss the two stage uh, approach in its entirety but i'm certainly not i'm not unique in wanting some more solid data on how that works especially a two-stage design that's not too fiddly um so i don't want anything that you have to where the new login details are generated for from the for the initial respondent to pass on to somebody else in the household or something like that so the couple of ideas we're kind of pursuing at the moment is the first is is simply to request that any adult completes the first questionnaire, use the household data to determine only the number of logins to offer in subsequent letters. So that those letters take the form, thank you for taking part, now we'd like to ask the people you live with to also take part. So 
it's still an all adults design, but we remove the motivation to inflate household size, reducing, but not obviously eliminating the risk of fabrication. The question of course remains whether a two stage design in general reduces net response. And I say that because we know that if we send an invitation and several reminders, the majority of responders within a particular household will respond to just one of those letters, suggesting the others are ignored. So a two stage design might suffer from subsequent letters being being ignored. So a more complex version, which seems fairly similar to the American uh, National Action Study, is to ask the initial respondent to provide the names either of all the other adults in the household or one particular, one in particular with a script selecting who. So, for example, in a three adult household, the choices might be between the initial respondent, so there's no need to interrupt the uh, questionnaire at that point, uh, or the oldest or youngest other adult. And then we can use the name that we obtain to address letters to all these adults, or the sampled one if that's the design we're using. This ought to strongly reduce the risk of fabrication, but we need an ethical way of collecting the name or names that does not itself uh, encourage fabrication. And I'm also a little wary of the sample one approach in that the individual level data from the first respondent ends up being discarded in a little under half of cases, which substantially ups the cost uh, per completed questionnaire. Uh, obviously, neither idea is new, but the recent tests I've seen of similar approaches have either been uh, rather small or not in the UK context. So we'd certainly like to get a firmer set of evidence for how these work in practice. Apologies for the sl my slides didn't go forward at all, but uh, Nevertheless, I've now finished, so I will stop sharing. Thanks, Joel. Does anyone have any questions of clarification for Joel? If not, we may move to discussion questions. At least one of those has come in already. So let me let me kick off with a, a question from Tim Hansen, um, aimed particularly at Patton and Joel. He says, "Do you think there's any merit in giving the random selection of one adult approach another try in the UK, um, given based on the confirmation approach that, that Kristen presented earlier?" Um, he says that seemed fairly promising for some of the examples. I also. Please do, Patton. Uh, I mean, it was, it, 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 the confirmation is, method is clearly clearly improves things, um, but it still leaves. I mean, there's still quite a lot of error in there, from, at least from my reading of the, of the uh, at least one of the, one of those papers you wrote, Kristen. Um, so I mean, it's yeah, it, dep it depends so much, I think, on the individual survey and everything else. I mean, it does depend on things like the, you know, the, the nature of the variables you're looking at and whether it's stuff which is going to vary within the household, as Chris mentioned earlier, and that kind of thing. Um, but it's going to, it still does, I mean, while improved, it still leaves a fairly large chunk of, 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 of incorrect selections. So that, that would be, that's my initial worry about it. I, mean, I haven't actually scrutinized this in any, any huge detail. I tried to, you know, do a, a careful trade off between doing that and the other methods. But I mean, that was my, that's my instinctive response. I suppose. And by my, uh, I mean, one of the things you've got to remember, if you're actually going to present some sort of selection method to the respondents, so we try and keep it straightforward, and next birthday is one of them. Although I'm not sure I necessarily know that about uh, everybody in the household, uh, even my own family, but leave that aside, um, is that when we look at it, although it's not perfect, um, you it seems to me that in in households with at least two people about a 40 percent or so it is the right it is it's it's more likely to be the right person than you'd think if you were just sort of randomly uh taking any anybody um so there is so, so a percentage of them do comply is what i'm rambling on about um and i think i mean my view actually is that the key thing with these sorts of surveys is the random sample of addresses massively uh, constrains the actual set possible samples that you could do and the risks might be a bit overstated about say taking you know a certain number of people it's not the next birthday i.e. that there's a certain weakness in the random 
random sampling procedure as it goes forward. But actually, the way it actually percolates out to the uh, survey estimates you want to make might be fairly limited, uh, in which case, why not do something which is simple and increases the, the chances that people actually do it, do it properly, but accept a certain error level, you know, as being, you know, relatively small. Which I think rather rather relates to Peter's earlier question to me, and in, in a sense, one has to be sort of trading trading off the impact of selection error against the you know the, the non-response error, which we ne we have to we've always had to live with. So um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay, we have a clarification question that is specifically for Joel. So I'm going to take that one next. Um, Joel, you're being asked, why is it that you would not want to ask an initial respondent to pass on the contact request to other household members in a two-stage design? Well, I specifically don't want to create sort of login details, which they have to somehow pass on. And I've seen mechanisms where people write it down, which is one way of doing it, or they uh, are given a sort of email that they can email off to somebody else in their household. For me, it just see, just is instinctively, it seems fiddly, um, fiddly and likely to lead to some sort of uh, error. I would actually prefer, if you're going to do that process, I prefer a two stage in which we control it. Now, there's sometimes when you've got time pressures, you might adopt that sort of thing. But it, I would probably just go with the kind of things that Kristen was describing if there's a time pressure. And if there isn't, I'd rather bring it back and actually leave the original respondent alone and then concentrate on the new on the newer respondent. But um, again, this, I, I, I'm not sure Kristen probably knows more about how evidenced it is, my feeling that this is fiddly and likely to lead to people dropping out. Um, which I, I lost part of which part is fiddly. I, so I think I, you know, I think there's a lot of parts where things can go wrong in the within household selection, including including the handoff, which I think is what you're talking about. If yeah. there was the need to pass it on to somebody else, and um, that is, I think, I think the the one of the issues in the in many of the two stage selections the the question becomes how do you get that information into the hand the hands of the selected person if they're not the person who is collecting the screener right so if you stay in the same mode of data collection um, that becomes do you get an email address or a a phone number to text somebody if you're in a country that permits texting of survey links or do you mail them a letter that contains cover uh, the same sort of cover letter information and login information or do you just trust the person who was your initial respondent to hand it over to that 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 other household member and and i don't think you know i don't think we have a really uh good answer to all those different pieces. The surveys that have um, experimentally manipulated mode on mail versus web with a screening instrument have shown higher rates of completion to the mail screener, but uh, higher rates of completion for the sort of main questionnaire when it's a uh, web screener because the web uh, when when folks complete that web screener, there's a higher rate of just com going on overall, right? There, because you don't have to switch modes in order to do it. So, but how to improve the handoff is the hard thing, right? And that's what we were trying with the confirmation question is pointing out to the person there might be a handoff that's needed. And so can we get folks to do that handoff? And I'll, I'll just point out too that this confirmation question and handoff issue is not unique to web. We have the same problem on telephone surveys where we're doing some kind of random selection within the household and somebody has to pass the phone to somebody else in the household to do it. And the rates of inaccurate selection on these more quasi probability methods on the telephone are similar to the rates of inaccurate selection that we see in, in self-administered surveys. So we're, we're uniquely aware of these things now, but the problem is not new. The problem has been with us in the within household selection world for quite a while and the rates at which it goes wrong is really similar in the web mode as it is in the telephone mode. I think we're just a little bit more cognizant of these, these discrepancies. So, um, 
so my my thought is we we have a lot of ways to try to improve it um, in in getting the handoff to work in these multiple household selection or multiple household multiple adult households um, and and it. it there, it's likely to depend on the survey itself and how timely it needs to be, how much time, what our budget is, can we go to another mode to send that cover letter to that second person and so on. I think, I think one of the advantages of the handoff method is that you aren't forced to actually collect information from one person about other people in the household. Now, I've tended to think that if you collect name of the other person household, that is somehow seems okay but if you start trying to collect their telephone numbers or their email addresses or something, that you really need to ask that person whether they have permission to give any of this information to you. I think in, in the past, we tended to be rather blasé about that. And there's all those longitudinal surveys where we collected stable contacts, you know, alternative outside of household contacts without, I don't think, ever checking whether those people were fine with that. But I think in modern... Uh, data protection regulations, we have to find a point where we think it's, this is a reasonable amount of information to collect about somebody else. Now, I think name would be okay. So you can collect the name, then write to that person once you either through the script or back in the office effectively samples the next, the, the next stage. But I'd be uncomfortable with anything more than that. But I'm not sh quite sure why, why I'm drawing the line there rather than, than anywhere else. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether, I mean, I always worry about GDPR, which is, can, can be very zealously enforced, and I'm not sure whether that would, wouldn't actually be conflicting with it, too. But also, I mean, you to, you're, you're right, we used to do these things. You know, we'd be much more blasé in the past. Um, but it's, it's not just the regulations that change. I think public attitudes have changed quite considerably yeah. over that time. So, just, yeah, it's, 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 for the reason you say, I just think it becomes infeasible. Um, never mind the GDPR or anything else, it's becomes becoming infeasible anyway. I'm aware we're a little bit over time, but we still have lots of good questions coming in. So if nobody minds, I'm going to suggest we carry on for just a few more minutes and um, try to get through a couple more very good questions. Um, but can I ask the panelists to try and keep your answers as brief as you can so we can get through more questions? Um, I'm going to paraphrase, if I may, uh, a question sent in by Charles Lound. He's asking about um, the situation where we're implementing a one-stage approach where we say up front that there are conditional incentives. So he's talking about the situation where there's a risk of people inventing other household members. Um, and, and the question is, in that situation, do we or should we uh, make it clear up front that we would consider um, the invention of other household members to be to be fraud, to be something we want to avoid? And if we somehow imply by that that there's a there's a chance that we might follow up and check out what they've said. Um, would that reduce the risk of people inventing other household members? What do the panelists think? I don't think you should imply that you're going to check up on them if you can't. Um, and I think that also saying some using a term like fraud, which actually we used to use when we talked about this, just seemed excessive for what was actually happening. Um, so. <laughs> I, I mean, when we go go for it, we try and say we get a declaration at the end before they get the incentive, but it, the incentive isn't conditional on it. We're trying to get at the same thing, but we're trying to put it back on them to for them to uh, be openly saying this is what, you know, this was completed once, honestly, and, you know, with due care and attention and kind of moving it back towards them rather than pretending we can do something that we're really not going to do. We did once check test to try and think if we collect telephone numbers, we could go back and validate some of this stuff. Uh, and of course, hardly anybody will give your telephone number for that reason, and certainly not the people cheating. Yeah, I can't. I certainly agree with the, with the point, Joel's point that if, you know, you, unless you can actually do it and follow through, then yeah, you know, don't make the threat. But in terms of the language, which if it's just, if it's just an implication, I mean, I'd be I'd be willing to give it a go but very firmly on an experimental basis so i think there's i'm always wary about any kind of negativity in your communications with 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 yeah. uh some you know, sample members you're trying to recruit anything that seems a bit kind of arsy i just think could well put people off so yeah, i'd want to do that very strictly exper experimentally very strictly anything to add Kristen? 
I would say I tend to worry more about underreporting of people in the household than overreporting of in people in the household. That usually the the issue is that you forget who lives there, or you are, if, especially if you have people who have multiple addresses, children, uh, you know, adult children, teenagers who are going between uh, parents who live in different households. Where do they count college students? Where do they count those kinds of things? Then the overreporting of people in the household. We have a very good question from Dean Fletcher, which I guess is aimed mainly at you, Patton. Um, in the sampling up to two approach, um, his question is, do, do you tend to obtain certain types of household members rather than others? So his example is, are you more likely to get the head of household or their spouse rather than adult children being the people who select in if you just allow any two? Do you have any evidence of that? No, but that's an because I haven't looked. Um, not the, I, I mean, I don't think in any of the surveys that we're doing this on, we'd, we'd ever be able to establish head of house or, well, I mean, it's not head of house anymore, it's a moment, house or reference person. Um, so, so no, but I mean, in principle, I suppose anything's got a grid, we could be looking at this adult you know, children thing, but we, no, we haven't. But I mean, it's a good question. It's a good question. I agree. Yeah. We did, uh, one point we tried to use the all adult, an all adult survey to simulate other selection mecha mechanisms, obviously lots of caveats around that. But with any two, so we were essentially saying, well, all right, the first two people who took part, that's any two. Um, or, and that that subset of those who took part in the all adults is, is what we would expect if we were doing any two. The distinction is that the, the uh, bulge tends to be around the middle in terms of age. So you don't get as many uh, adult children as you would with all adults because they tend to respond only after their parents have responded first so there's quite a distinct difference there it's not as bad as just picking one where it's almost always a uh, you know head of household or partner or something like that and very rarely a young adult so I think any two does you know pretty well there it's just it will be a little bit short on that on that point I did, I did uh, in doing this, weight all of these, these sort of pseudo samples to the same calibration weighting matrix. And both any two and all adults had very similar variation in weights, which suggested that they produced profiles that were sort of, had a similar level of bias, even if not an identical actual, you know, bias in particular dimensions. I'm going to make this the last question and apologies to any participant whose question we haven't managed to reach. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. So the very last question is just a follow up to Kristen's comment just now about the rate of wrong selections in telephone surveys also being high. The question is whether any of the presenters have any information on whether that's true also for face to face surveys. We might assume that the interviewer would improve compliance, um, but we just the, the, the question is wondering how widely this has been looked at but and how much the interviewer might improve compliance but my answer is i don't i don't know and i, sus I suspect you peter would know better than better than me having worked having worked together in the same organization organization for a decade or two uh when at the time of peak face-to-face -face field work um I, I mean i just got on with it really and did it but you have a much more methodological role I don't, I don't know did you collect any evidence on that i mean i didn't but um so i i, I genuinely don't know the answer but I suspect you may have sources of information I don't have. <laughs> that was neat, wasn't it? <laughs> well done. I'm back. Didn't, didn't anybody else have any evidence? I think that for me, the bigger issue is that in face to face surveys, we tend to not use more quasi probability methods. And so in a face to face survey, we collect a household roster and then we use some sort of probability method, a Kish grid or uh, some other random selection from within that household roster, rather than knocking on the door and saying who in the household is the youngest adult or who in the household has the next birthday. Or we're doing the within, or, or we're not doing within household selection with, uh, at the time of rostering because we start with a household interview and then we do a roster and then we select a sampled adult or a sampled child or whatever the goal might be or we interview multiple people so i think the issue related to face-to-face -face surveys is a is a slightly different one which has to do with how well does the interviewer obtain a complete roster 
gender of people in the household? And then how well does that represent the full population that's of interest, whether it's adults, whether it's all household members, whether it's children? We did, I did recently do a kind of the Rizzo method in face-to-face -face, uh, context. Um, and I was, I was quite interested. You see who the respondents are, whether they were the... Uh, I did it as, you know, it's either you or the other uh, other person you live with, if it's two, and then you or the oldest other person or the youngest, uh, that kind of thing. And I was interested to see, it, you know, what was the response level? So if you, uh, in the three-person households, how often did you get the, pers the person who answered the door and how often not? I was expecting the person to answer the door to dominate, uh, but it didn't actually. Uh, and and I, certainly with two and three, it did a bit... If there were four or more adults, it was much, it was more likely to be the person who answered the door who actually took part in the, in the survey. But otherwise, it didn't seem to be a huge response difference, which suggested that the handoff process wasn't, you know, a particular problem. But I, I know it's very partial evidence, but well, I'll, I'll just add a very small comment. I, there's a little bit of evidence on this point from the European Social Survey. Um, there's a paper by Akim Koch and another one by Piotr Yabkowski where they use some kind of internal validation methods to try and assess compliance rates um, for those countries that have address-based samples and therefore a selection method. Um, and it seems to me that the evidence is that there are there are quite a few countries where the non-compliance rate seems to be vanishingly small. It, it really is very small, but there are a few countries where it's quite noticeably non-zero. Um, and of course, we don't know what's going on there, whether it's the interviewer that's driving this or the respondent that, that's hoodwinking the interviewer or what, but there certainly does seem to be some imbalance in the samples that can't otherwise be explained in, in some countries. Um, but read those papers for more information. Um, Do the countries follow national stereotypes? <laughs> uh, I said, read the papers and decide for yourself what you think the stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> I shall not comment in public. Um, with that, I think we, we really are well over time, so I need to wrap it up, but I would just like to thank all of the panellists for their contribution to what I think has been, been a really interesting seminar. Um, we've had lots of participation and lots of, lots of good questions. We could have gone on quite a bit longer, um, but we mustn't. But thank you all. <laughs>